The president of Poland has given the first in-person address by a foreign leader to the Ukrainian parliament since Russia launched its invasion. Andrzej Duda offered his country's steadfast support and said only Ukraine could decide its own future. Football, the Premier League title race between Manchester City and Liverpool, will be decided this afternoon. Manchester City play Aston Villa, Liverpool play Wolves. BBC News. The sun ago, so it still have an impact today, is at a quarter to three. First on Radio 4, Cathy Clugston and her team of gardening experts are back for the best in horticultural advice. It is, of course, Gardener's Question Time. Hello and welcome. This week we're in London on the Euston Road on stage at the Welcome Collection, a free museum and library exploring health and the human experience. It's often likened to a cabinet of curiosities. It emerged from the personal collection of Henry Welcome, a pharmaceutical entrepreneur and keen collector of items relating to the art and science of healing. Well, gardening would definitely come under that umbrella. And today on GQT, we've collected for you a panel of experts chock full of health and human experience. Please welcome our very own Cabinet of Curios and Smith and Bank. Later in the programme, James will be attempting to attain vegetal enlightenment by reflecting on the world of plants and fungi with one of the curators of an exhibition here at the Welcome Collection called Rooted Beings. But now, let us turn to the beings in front of us, our fantastic live London audience, who has our first question today. Hello. Sorry, I can't believe I'm the first person. This is terrifying. Um, I'm Chloe. I'm from South East London. Um, Tim, and I'm going to have some small raised beds on the roof. Um, can you suggest any plants that will give interest throughout the year and are no more than 50 centimetres tall? It doesn't have to be that exact. Um, so we can still squeeze under the bridges when we're uh, cruising along. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so we need some plants that you like to be squished together. We have to always, with narrow boots, be aware of weight, I guess, and not overloading uh, the roof and that kind of thing. But if you've taken care of that, let's start with you, James. Something for a raised bed on a narrow boat. Good question. I think, uh, so you, the conditions you're going to be having there will be full sun for most of the time, I'm imagining, Definitely. unless they're moored up. Um, on top of that, you're going to be having quite a low root run because you're not going to be having too much material, mainly for weight, but also for height. Yeah. So if you're looking at plants that will need shallow roots, won't grow too, too high, and also have full sun, I would probably go with Mediterranean slash coastal species. Yeah. So I would go something like um, some thrift, maybe, uh, which are like tiny little carnation flowers that are pink. You can also go for a whole range of alpine plants, which are adapted, strangely enough, completely opposite geography, but very, very similar conditions. Thank you. Pepper, what would you be putting on this roof? Well, the first thing I was going to suggest is, in fact, an elaboration of one of the things Jane said, and that's you want a herb garden, mm. because you're going to be hopefully doing your own cooking, maybe having some drinks on board, and you, you, so many of the Mediterranean herbs would do really well in those situations. And, and don't forget with thymes, they don't have to be just thyme flavoured. You can get lovely lemon thymes and so forth. And you can have marjorams and you could maybe grow some sage. And there's a, a lovely sage variety called Tricolor because it's got pink and creamy white and sage green leaf. Just really quickly, a couple of quick suggestions for white work inside the boat because those are quite um, unusual conditions. It gets very bit, cold in the winter. Yeah, well. cold and dark, <laughs> I guess. Single glazing. So I'm imagining indoors in an hour boat, you're going have to have small plants, not a huge amount of space. I'm imagining it's relatively dark inside as well? Yeah, it does get quite dark. Okay, so if it also gets cold, there's something that I'd love to grow and I can't grow in a centrally heated at home, which is a uh, high altitude Malaysian begonia called Begonia pavanina, the peacock begonia. And it only, it really, really needs a, a cool condition, which I can't grow it in. Uh, it needs darkness to really shine out, to live up to its name. Um, it shines like a butterfly's wing with iridescent foliage in blues and pinks, but it only does that in low light conditions. It's an adaptation to low light. So if you're dark and cool, you can grow that. As long as it's frost-free, like proper. Oh, hopefully it will be. Yeah. Okay. If you were in it, hopefully it'll be frost-free. Yeah. There you go. Ideas for inside and out, Chloe. Good luck on your new adventure. Thanks very much. Thank you. Who's next, please? Hello, panel. I'm Kate Suttle from Teddington in southwest London. Can you recommend an attractive climber for total shade that isn't hedera? <laughs> what have you got against ivy, Kate? I love ivy, but the garden has a lot of ivy in it, and we'd like to have something different. Okay, and what sort of, what sort of size of space? 
It's about, it's a wall which is about three, two to three metres width, maybe um, two metres high. Okay, let's see what the panel have to, to suggest. Anne Swedenbank. Well, the classic, and you may have already thought about this because it is such a classic, is the climbing hydrangea, which is con always recommended for a north-facing wall. And it does very well on them, better than it does on a south-facing wall. So, yes, I, I think that would be the one to go for. Um, they do take a while to get going. You tend to plant it. And there are several other sort of related plants that all react in the same way. Um, there's pylostegia, uh, not pylostegia, yes, pylostegia and there's schizophragma and they all kind of flop around at the base of the wall or fence for a while and then suddenly they start to grow so don't worry if it doesn't do anything for a couple of years it's just putting its roots down and making a kind of structure before it swarms up and the climbing hydrangea is self-clinging um, but you, you could give it a little bit of help as well just to make sure it stays attached to the wall so I, I would go for that. That will go right up a really tall wall as well. And just make sure the roots stay nice and moist at the base, of course. Pepper Greenwood, what would you suggest? I'm afraid I'm... Sheer <laughs> I was going to suggest exactly the same <laughs> thing. <laughs> it really is the only thing that I know that produces flowers or brats that really do more of his showiness really than anything else. James, any thoughts? No, I think those are both really good answers. They're, 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 they're standard answers, but they're standard for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give you some wild card ones that we can, you know, if you, if you wanted to step outside and maybe gamble a little bit, there are three things you could potentially do. So in London, what we have is the benefit of a slightly unusual climate. Um, it's much warmer here than it is in, in other parts of the UK because of the urban heat island effect. And that means you regularly see plants here that really couldn't be grown anywhere else other than the far, far southwest of Scotland. It's almost Mediterranean, just not quite that warm. So, given that, I might grow something like a ficus pomilla, uh, the creeping fig, which is the kind of thing that's usually sold as a house plant in the UK. Now, I am going to say something that may get people throwing things at me. So, I've constantly talked about how I don't like variegated plants. There is one situation in which I will tolerate them, and that's in really deep shade, because the little bits of white can often just bring a little bit of light and life to that space. And there are both forms that are variegated with white and cream and even a yellow version. And I've seen that regularly all through central London. Um, there's also the Chilean bell vine that really requires lots and lots of shade and a sheltered position um, but they certainly have quite a few at Kew and at Chelsea Physic Garden and Kew isn't right in the centre of London it's pretty far out and those produce these incredible um, well that's what it says on the tin bell shaped pendant uh, pink and white flowers it's, uh, Latin name is Lapageria and the final one and this is a real gamble um, I've seen Monstera grown outdoors in London Swiss cheese plant uh -huh. not just one and actually quite big so it depends if this is against a wall in central London in a really well protected position I think you could get away with it quite a lot to think about there Kate that's brilliant thank you very much let's take our next questioner please um, I'm Teresa Jesse um, right, I have a nut garden consisting of box hedging um, but I've also got box moss and uh, and it's a real big infestation it's just killed the whole thing and it probably was there last year and i ignored it i'm just thinking oh there's a, a few d leaves dying a bit of water more or something um and it looks very dead is it worth treating or should i just pull the whole thing out and start again so Teresa's photo is, is with you, Pamela. Have a look at it. James, would you just describe it for us, what, what the state of this poor knot garden is? Well, it's an immaculately pruned and very well planned out knot garden, but it also looks like it's been napalmed. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it's obviously been grown with you know, incredible skill and care for a certain number of years. But um, it's not green at all. It's enti like There's still foliage there, but it's there's, entirely straw coloured. There's a little bit of foliage at the end bit. Right? Okay. Yeah, there the is the, the green, the one just, green just bubble. The green it went. Up. It must have been going, and I wasn't paying attention. And have you seen lots of caterpillars? I have seen caterpillars, yeah. yes. Because yeah. I just wondered whether it's just, if you can say, just box tree moth caterpillar. Um, and I wondered maybe there wasn't a bit of blight or something in there as well. Well, I, when I saw it last year, that went through my mind, and I thought, well, I can't do anything about Light, I, you know, maybe I am going to have to start again. Well, I don't like giving up, and that's an amazing piece of clippedness. It looks, I think, rather like a sort of 
weaving of Cumberland sausage. It's, it's, Unfortunately, it's, it's emphasis on brown. It's <laughs> Fails, um, fails uh, Olympic rings. Oh, well, oh. Really. So it was supposed to go round. Um, oh, uh, I see. Yeah, it's sort of well, uh, yeah. tremendous. You don't want to lose it unless you absolutely have to. So I wouldn't give up quite yet. I'm not saying I think you're going to succeed, but I would want to try and succeed. And what I would do is I would start very promptly treating it, and I would treat it with a nematode-based control, which means that it's perfectly safe for wildlife, pets, you, and anything except the target there. And I would put that on three times at roughly seven-day intervals, uh -huh. trying to make sure, and that's a tricky bit, that you actually can get the nematode spray and you'll be watering canning it on probably or putting it on with a hose end feeder right. in, actually into the depths through all the caboodle that they create. Um, and that is a bit difficult, but that's what I would do because it, it does work quite well. It could take some time. Well, it will probably take some time, but I wouldn't want to give up on it. But if you do have to give up on it, I would say, for heaven's sake, treat yourself to a lovely day out and go to the RHS garden at Wisley. And right opposite the lab where I used to work is a little walled area that used to be packed full of bedding and tulips in my day and now has an amazing display called Thinking Outside the Box. And it is absolutely packed full of all sorts of things that they deemed would be possibly suitable to replace box. So it shows just how they look after a good few years of being pruned. And I hope it doesn't come to that. But if it does, there's some real inspiration in that. It's lovely. Thank you. Okay, best of luck, Teresa. Thank you. Who has our next question, please? Oh, hello. Um, my name is Susan and I've just moved to New Romney, which is on the Romney Marsh. Help. Um, <laughs> um, the soil is sandy, having previously been a seabed and we find shells. Um, what should I add to it? Grit, mushroom compost, topsoil or all of them? Oh, some pulled faces here on the panel. Susan, what, what are you hoping to achieve? Oh, um, I want to put plants that should be on the Romney Marsh. So you mentioned thrift and uh, maybe um, sea kale and things like that, um, and herbs. Okay, mm. so it's a question of, you know, sh should Susan be changing the soil or working with what she's got? Pippa? Well, I think if you want to increase the range of what you can grow and make things easier for yourself and also more pleasant for the plant, you probably do want to put a bit more organic matter in there. But then again, if you're also trying to follow the natural flora a bit, you don't want to change it too much. And I would say, I mean, do, you know, do you know what the pH of your soil is, how acidic or alkaline it is? No, but that's a really good starting point thank I, you i think i think you want to find out and i'm afraid i don't know because i've never lived in romney marsh but if you've got lots of seashells in there i'm sort of instantly thinking well perhaps it's a bit alkaline mm. because that tends to happen but i may be wrong so what i would say you do need to be careful of is something which is very strong ph of one sort or another and you mentioned mm. that word mushroom compost and it tends to be very strongly alkaline so if your soil is already quite alkaline you don't want to make it even more so and similarly if you're looking to have something a bit improved of an improved version of what's there already mm. you don't want to whack on something if alkaline is what it definitely isn't so mm. start by finding out what it is have a little look at what other people are growing locally as well and that might even give you a clue as to the level of acidity or alkalinity okay yeah, but i would you. get some organic matter in there of yeah. some sort but find out where you're going first thank you yeah a lot of variables mm. and to, to think about certainly are but yes the sorts of plants you're talking about would like that and it will keep them nice and compact and also help them survive winter because a lot of those plants would obviously die off a lot quicker if they were on a clay soil like mine. I mean, I try to grow sea kale because I 
like eating the young shoots mm. and it's a very beautiful plant yeah. but on clay you know you can put a plant in and after about three years it becomes it grows too much it becomes woody in its crown and then a cold wet winter will kill it off mm -hmm. but in your soil it, it should last for a lot longer mm. um, I mean you can't be a million miles from where Derek Jarman created his famous no, garden I'm so look yeah. at pictures of that and get the inspiration mm -hmm. and lots of plants were seen the name um, that, that are growing on the sort of top of the seashore naturally in the country as long as the pH is roughly neutral they, sh they, they should be fine to grow there um, horned poppy and all of the poppies mm. that grow on the shore you'll have so much fun yeah. you'll be able to grow plants that people on clay soils can only dream about <laughs> <laughs> thank you best of luck Sue very much and uh, as ever, all the plants mentioned by the panel today will be on the GQT page of the Radio 4 website. Just find this episode and scroll down. You'll see them listed there. We'll take more questions from the audience here at the Welcome Collection shortly. But there is an intriguing exhibition on here at the moment. Over the last few years, more gardeners and growers have found mental stimulation in greenery. We know that gardening and being around plants is good for us. But what can we learn from the plants themselves when it comes to attaining vegetal enlightenment? Well, one of GQT's most enlightened beings, James Wong, caught up with the curator of the Rooted Beings exhibition, Emily Sargent, to learn more about it. You know, Emily, one of the great privileges of my work is it gets me to go to these things that, you know, I might have always wanted to do, but never got round to. And I've gone past the Welcome Collection hundreds of times as a Londoner, never managed to get it in. And on top of that, I've seen this exhibition all over Instagram. So when they called to say I could come, I was so excited. Tell me about what, what you're doing with Rooted Beings. Welcome Collection is a museum and gallery that really is interested in unpicking our relationship with health. And this exhibition really aims to invite us all to reconsider our relationship with plants. So these ancient, complex, sophisticated beings that we rather take for granted in our everyday life. As an ethnobotanist, a scientist that studies the human use of plants, I mean, this is right up my street. I've actually seen some of the bits of research and areas of research in the world which I've worked at. But this isn't like a straight up scientific exhibition. Walking in here, I mean, it looks much more like an art exhibition. I've seen like every type of media used from costumes to kind of tapestries and embroidery to much more traditional uh, pieces. What's going on here? Tell me about the art. So at Welcome Collection, we often work, yes, with historical archives, science research, health research, but also with artists. And I think particularly in this um, exhibition, we've really invited artists to imagine ways in which we can recalibrate those relationships with plants, both in terms of how we might learn from their symbiotic relationships that they um, cultivate across different species, to think about um, the histories of the ways in which we've used and sometimes abused plants and the, the places that they've come from, but also um, to reimagine uh, new relationships with plants, I suppose. The more you look here, the more fascinating it is. I see it all like an example. Do you have any favorite aspects of the exhibition? Um, there's lots of really fascinating objects in uh, the exhibition and that kind of invite us to think about plants in different ways. Okay. I love coming into the exhibition and seeing um, this enormous passiflora, so this huge yes. passion flower. Um, so this is a, a piece of work by an artist called Ingela Ehrman, who's really interested in embodying plant life. So this is a costume um, for a oh. performance. So it's a huge Passiflora cerulea, the, you know, the, the really common garden variety, white with these really bright purple and, um, and burgundy stripes. And it looks to me like a kind of a, a sculpture. Where, how, do you, how does the body fit into that? I can't even see where your head would go through. So this is part of a series of costumes that Ingler has made for what she describes as blooming performances. So it's a way in which she's trying to get closer to the act of blooming so oh. um, she would stand in the centre of the of the flower. Yes, um, I can and, see that. And the petals would be closed, and then they would open, and she would be part of the blooming process. And then an audience would be invited to share the nectar at the base of the petal. <laughs> so each one of these petals is what attached on a string, and they can close. The whole flower can close and open. The whole flower can close and open, but it, the performance happens only once in an in an exhibition's run to mirror the behaviour of the flower. So it blooms just once. Yes, they only. They only closing, go yeah. for one day, Passiflora, yeah. and then they're, they're withered. 
one of the things I didn't expect for an exhibition all about plants is how important the sound is and how this eerie soundscape evolves as you move through the space. So you feel like you're wandering in a forest. But I don't... Are these plant-based sounds? Um, so in this space, um, you can hear these kind of clicking sounds um, and this kind of atmospheric soundtrack. And this um, was composed by uh, Patricia Dominguez and one of her collaborators. Um, it features some of the kind of atmospheric sounds of the samples that are, are, are on display within this within this installation. So chinchona bark tapping together, but it was also composed after Patricia and her her musician had um, taken ayahuasca. So oh. one of the um, one of the totems here contains um, some samples of Banisteria. So Banisteriopsis is a plant from uh, the Amazon used to make ritual hallucinogen ayahuasca. So that influenced the, the kind of nature of the soundtrack, but it's also kind of referencing some of the kind of um, ideas of kind of the preparation and the, and, the, and the properties, the material properties of some of the samples of, of, of material that you can see in this. What do you hope people get and will take away with them when they come here? What we're really hoping that people will, will come away from this exhibition with is a kind of renewed respect um, for plants, a renewed uh, excitement in what, um, not just what they offer us, but what we can learn from them. So they're complex, ancient beings attentive to each other, to the environment around them. What can we learn from that? How can we engage with with the plant world and and bring a little bit that of that into our own lives and be a bit more plant ourselves i think even as someone who works with plants every day and lives with you know 500 of them so i am surrounded by them all the time i think this really allows me to see them in a really different perspective just things like making plants absolutely enormous it makes you feel tiny like when you're you're a kid and you walk into a natural history museum and see dinosaurs and using them made like using different materials instead of the actual plant themselves yeah it's fascinating so james i had a quick chance to look around that exhibition earlier it's it's wonderful you one of the things that i really expected is to be filled with plants Oh, it's an it's a exhibition all about plants and their benefits and their history, and there were no plants in there. <laughs> and I think it's, it's fascinating the way you can so convincingly uh, tell the story of plants through an art exhibition that uses every media from like multimedia screens and soundscapes uh, to, to costumes and you know old artifacts. Uh, and not use a single live plant, so definitely worth checking out. Yeah, so that Rooted Beings exhibition is on until the 29th of August if you're in or can get to London, and it's free. We're here at the Welcome Collection for Gardener's Question Time on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. I'm Cathy Clugston, and joining me on the panel today are Anne Swithenbank, James Wong and Pippa Greenwood, along with an audience of garden enthusiasts. Give them a hello, audience. <laughs> Who is next with a question? Hello team, my name's Karen and I'm from Chesson in Hertfordshire. I love my winter flowering cherry tree, Prunus subhotella autumnalis. It behaves exactly as I believe it is meant to. It flowers in October and November, intermittently throughout the winter, and again with a showy display in March and April. I'm afraid my question is a bit technical. What factors stimulate flowering over such a long period of three seasons? You're just showing off, aren't you, really? <laughs> You're a fabulous tree. Um, okay, well, we love a technical question on this programme. Anne, would you like to start us off? Why not? Um, most winter flowering plants need to attract pollinators, and there are fewer pollinators on the wing during the winter. So they have adapted to open their flowers over a much longer period. Right. And you'll notice, um, I notice it especially with viburnums, especially with the uh, viburnum bodnatensi, viburnums that are flowering in the winter. Um, they will often wait with their buds and then a few buds will open during a mild spell and there might be some insects flying around and then they will wait again and then a, during a cold spell and then again they'll come out so you, you might find that your cherry is doing a bit of that too and they're waiting for the few bees that might be on the wing in the winter because some of them do come out and, and forage for nectar and also some moths that are uh, winter flying and so 
As it's cool, their flowers are not going over quickly and they have the motive for making them last a long time and also for opening them slowly and gradually here and there over a longer period. James, would you add anything? Yeah, so plants, um, particularly temperate plants, have a undergo a phenomenon called vernalization. Um, and that comes from the word for winter. So mm -hmm. basically winter causes certain triggers that encourage them to do certain things. Um, and that can be a combination of factors like daylight hours. So the plant can actually not just detect how much sun there is and the intensity of the sun, they can actually detect the amount of sun they're getting and they use that as a trigger. The other one is uh, the amount of hours the temperature drops below a certain threshold. So there are certain, that's why if you try and grow things like uh, the temperate prunus in the tropics, they don't grow all year round. They get really confused. You know, I used to live in Ecuador and the temperature at the tops of the mountains was relatively cool and fresh. So you could get away with growing apple trees. But because they didn't have all the signals, they would be randomly flowering, fruiting and losing and growing new leaves all at the same time. They couldn't decide what they wanted to do because they didn't have the right triggers. Now, I'm going to imagine that in prunus, it's probably the number of chilling hours they're getting. Um, and then when the temperature goes above a th certain threshold, the growth regulators that really spark the buds that are already there into flowering kick into play. So it needs a certain number of cool hours to, to grow at all, but when it goes above that, these hormones are then released and then cool down when the temperature drops and then released again. I'm not 100% sure. Uh -huh. This is a guess. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I kind of have a good idea of the mechanisms that could be creating that. Right. Okay. It is basically temperature is the main, yeah. you may need a chilling factor, but it is the actual trigger to do it tends to be increasing temperature. Yeah. But I'd say you're doing quite well to have it that flowering no beautiful. that many it is, um, It's stunning, yeah. I have to say. It's, and when I first had it, I couldn't believe that it, it flowered every spring. I expected mm. it to flower in the, in the autumn and the winter. And it took me by every year, I would think, well, it's not going to do this again. And every year, it beautifully flowered spectacularly. In the I've never well. managed it. To, to, you know, I, I do mean, nothing it's, to yeah. it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Three seasons, yes, basically. Yes, so. it's beautiful. Well, well keep doing what you're doing, you. uh, even if it's nothing. It's nothing. <laughs> I do nothing to it at all. It's always wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Who has our next question, please? Hello panel, I'm Maria from Pleasant Hearts. Um, how do I get the stripes back on an indoor plant that I've divided it, um, it was one big plant and I've divided it into three and it seemed about the same time it, it had um, little circles of black and I only know it as a tiger plant but it's not got leaves, it's just tall round spikes yeah i think they're oh, not it's about, about this tall a lot of the audience i think i think they know what it is oh and um, what's happened so you've you've divided it yes um and what's happened and it's just faded back to green ah, it hasn't okay. got the black rings so, James, you're nodding away. You've got a good idea what the plan might be? I think I do, but then I'm going to look like that kid that knew all the answers in school and then didn't. Well, and that was it's school. very hard, but no. Uh, no I'm assuming it. it's a more of the columnar-shaped Sansevieria. Do you reckon that could be it, then? Yes, I Just was checking. thinking the same lines, but I'm worried mm. about the black rings. So these look like fingers that yeah. pop out the surface yeah, of the soil, exactly, but they're, yeah. they're yeah. sort of like if I would oh. take a rubber glove, uh, pop it out the soil, spray mm. it green, and then it had concentric dark yeah. rings from yeah, the, the outside, yeah. then I think I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Mm. Um, there are two reasons why you can lose variegation. Um, one of them is you're growing the plant in a really dark environment and it stops, to pro it stops producing the variegation so it can get the most out of the sunlight. Okay. The other one can be division and it sounds like you have that. Mm. And that's because variegation is usually created by what's called a chimera. So you have two genetic individuals that occupy the same body. So uh, it's like you have an evil twin and it's living in your body. Um, it actually happens with animals as well. So sometimes when you see a black cat uh, and it, but it has a white side to its face and a different colored eye, you sometimes see it with uh, fruits as well. You have an apple that's perfectly red on one side and a really, really clear break and then it's perfectly green on the other side. Uh, if you look up the word chimeral variegation, um, it's, it's found throughout uh, the, the animal and plant kingdoms. Um, and I suspect that when you took your division, 
you split the plant and only kept one of the two chimeras that are living in the same body. Okay. And so in that case, it's genetic and you can't get it yeah. back. If it is light, like to do with light, the darker environment will suppress the lighter colored twin and a brighter environment will encourage it. It would be interesting to put some of the new, the new offsets, as it were, back to wherever the original striped plant was mm -hmm. to check out the daylight thing. But I also think sometimes you get, as a result of transplanting something or dividing something, it goes into a bit of a shock. It throws a bit of a wobbler. Mm. And then I wouldn't be at all surprised if given the same conditions that the first one had, it wouldn't start yes. to show that ringing again anyway. So yes. I wouldn't panic. No. No, because they're very no. slow growing. Mm. And I imagine we're yes. talking about the no. original leaves. It won't have produced it, new ones, no. will it? I mean, no. goodness me. Oh, so it's, it's the same, it's, then it's I definitely so. not splitting it. Le it's the no. same leaves. I reckon it is, because it's probably a, a variety of cylindrica or something. Yeah, exactly. and, and they're so slow that it probably mm. hasn't sent a new leaf up yet. So it's probably just the effect of it getting some it's more nourishment. Yeah, and right. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, when it's establishes, it's not sure. well if you've just repotted it. I would. When, when did you no. repot? A couple of months ago. Oh, no, it'll definitely be don't. fine for a while, mm. won't yeah. it? And then you can start feeding it. But a little bit, it's gone into its new compost and thought, oh, this is nice, yum. <laughs> so it's mm. absorbed it and it's actually sort of changed its colour because it's happy. Mm. And you'll be very careful with the watering because when they've just been repotted, mm. they can very easily be overwatered. Mm. But when once it's settled and filled the pot with its thick, fleshy roots and begun to send up some new shoot, new leaves, then I think it will gradually come back to its variegation as long as it's in reasonably good light. Yeah, and 100% right. If, it, if it's the same leaves, then you wouldn't have done that. It, the, the case in which what I said would be the case is if you had a variegated aroid, for example, which has really white patches and really green patches, and you accidentally cut a bit off that was just the green one, then that would happen on its new leaves. But if it's the existing ones, you've got the yeah. same genetic combination. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but nothing yeah. too much to worry about, Maria. No, lovely. Thank, Thank you, you very much. <laughs> Before we move on to our next question, I just want to dip briefly into the GQT email inbox. Boyana Connor in North Lancashire wrote in to say some lovely things about the programme, so thank you, Boyana. But she went on to say, after listening to the latest show today, I felt compelled to write to the esteemed panel member, James Wong, uh -oh. and defend the honour of watermelons. <laughs> James mentioned them not being particularly sweet, and I beg to differ. I would like to invite him to a watermelon tasting in Bulgaria in August, and I guarantee he'll change his mind. What is this, Twitter? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, do you remember Cole saying this about watermelon? I did, I do recall I said that. Um, <laughs> and I will, I will also add that, yeah, grown in a climate like Bulgaria, um, you're, which I, I've, I've been to, um, and I haven't had watermelons there, but I've had watermelons in the region. I've, I've eaten them in places like Serbia, and they are ridiculously sweet. And there's a really good um, biological reason for that. Um, higher sunlight levels and lower rainfall levels. What that creates is plants are living solar panels, and they create sugar using the sun. And when something has lower water levels, not only does it have higher sugar, there's less water literally diluting it in the fruit. And also, um, very often in these regions, these are uh, plants that are grown in a slightly different, less intensive way. So they don't have as much nitrogen fertilizer, for example, or they're not varieties that have been selected, modern varieties that are selected for movement and storage. Uh, and they, the production chains are smaller. So I'm 100% that watermelons are sweeter there. What I meant when I said watermelons are relatively, there's a lower sugar content, if you compare them to like grapes, where the sugar content can be something like 50% of the dried weight, a watermelon is much lower than that. But I'm casting no aspersions on exotic <laughs> Bulgarian exceptions to the rule. Oh, okay, so right. Bulgarian watermelons really are sweeter. And it yeah. uh, looks like you've got yourself a date, Boyana, in August. Let's go. <laughs> if you would like to contact us about any gardening-related question, it's very easy. Just email gqt at bbc.co.uk or you'll find us on Twitter at bbcgqt. Let's get back to our audience here in London. Who's next? Can I come with you? <laughs> Let's go on a melon eating day any time. <laughs> I love watermelon. <laughs> um, hello, I am Pearl and I live in West London. And I had a rosemary which just evolved into a topiary cube next to my front door. And then it got this sort of white fungus, and so I had to murder most of it. 
and cut off all the dead branches. And then it was okay, sort of half of it, but the fungus came back. And I do have a picture if you want to see it. Oh, yeah, we're in there forgetting everyone's and, phone um, today. It, can I save it? So, Sounds like a scale in. Pippa, here's a picture. Let's have, um, let's have your expert eye on that, the white fungus. The lovely thing about a phone, very nice phone, um, is that you can zoom in. And I am pretty sure, we've got quite a lot of cut stems, I'll pass it along okay, to the rest of them. Go. But I'm pretty sure that I can see some scale insects there. And that there are some scale insects which produce a lot of white waxy fibres and it makes them look like a fungus. It looks like a sort of hyperactive downy mildew really. Yeah. And those are actually the egg masses. And then they have a little brown, fairly boring looking shell part if you like and and that makes it look all the more just like a bit of rough bark with white fungus growing out underneath it and they there are there are certain ones which will certainly feed quite intensely on rosemary and they feed by sucking the sap so they really of course it starts to die back which is why you've had to i think you used to do a murder didn't you which is quite dramatic but <laughs> you've had to murder it in parts but you haven't killed it off yet so. do i need a magnifying <laughs> glass to look no i think i think what you have to look at is look at the white fluffy stuff and sometimes you get a sort of a uh, splurge of white fluffy stuff which is the egg mass and sometimes you get a central blob which is the insect itself but it doesn't look like an insect because you can't see an antennae or legs or anything exciting it's just all sort of packed under this little shell and then you'll see the white waxy fibers and i'm 99 percent sure that that's your main if not your only problem so i would try and a remove those if you possibly can and something like a toothbrush is very handy with soapy yeah. water and you can't really legally use soap as an insecticide so of course i'm not suggesting that i'm saying that you you just use it to wash off those little insects and their eggs because you don't want to have them accumulating like on the very plant. liquid sort of that's but any sort of liquid would liquid soap would do okay. or washing up liquid kind of thing but not too much because you don't want to damage the plant but it will help to wash them off and that will that will help okay thank you very much let's squeeze in one more question before the end of the program hi panel uh, my name is rosie loveford i'm from tooting i wanted to ask if any of the panel ever named their house plants and if so is there a story behind the name <laughs> for context i have a swiss cheese plant named jesus who i found after someone had thrown him out of a flat window onto a construction site in january oh. he started coming back to life on easter sunday <laughs> <laughs> oh amazing yes i have um a plant called nigel gibson um, Pippa. You have, why does it have a surname? It just does. Okay. It's a very proper sort of plant. <laughs> well, I had a yucca called Bob. After Bob uh, Nardew? Uh, no, no, long before I knew. No, this when I was a student. It uh, came from home in Putney, and it went up to Durham for three years, and it had one very nasty experience when, in my final year, I lived out, not in, in college, and um, one of my housemates didn't like Bob. And uh, in a, I think rather drunken stupor, he put Bob in the back garden. And this was County Durham, Durham City, snow. Um, but Bob actually survived and was brought inside and a lot of apologies had to be made. And then went to Reading with me after that and then has been moving round and eventually finally turned up his toes a few years ago. Oh, yeah, R.I.P. Bob. Bob. Good. <laughs> and it's normal to name your plants, right? Well, yes. Um, Lisa, yes. Um, funnily enough, I name my cars, but I don't name my plants. But maybe not too many. many cars, <laughs> you would. But you I used don't. to have a spider with a name that lived on your wing mirror. Clarence. Yeah, well, there you go. I couldn't remember the name, but I remember on one recording and proudly announced that Clarence, now I remember the name, had got all the way there successfully. And I just hope Clarence got home. But it, it was awful because he, he used to. I like how you said that, like, obviously, Clarence. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was quite, it was quite friendly, but I used to worry about him because obviously his web was on the wing mirror and um, he often didn't, he often forgot to tuck himself away as we set off on a journey. <laughs> he'd be wobbling in the wind and I think Clarence get in get in <laughs> and and he often did and he would go miles and yeah 
I don't know what eventually happened to him, but going back to the house plants, I, I'm ashamed to say that I don't. I, I pack them, talk to them, sing to them. I generally address them all as you. Right, but you, you, you obviously talk to them. Yes, the oh, yes. Thing. James, you have 500 odd house plants. Um, yeah. I'm slightly worried if they all had names. They don't have names, and I, I often joke that because I'm really, really terrible with people and social skills, and I can never remember their names. I feel like if people had Latin names, I would remember them so much better. Because <laughs> I'm good with plant names, just terrible with people names. What I have done is I have um, named my terrariums. And that's only because when I'm talking to my friends, because all my friends are weird as well and have terrariums, I need to specify which one I'm talking about. So I have one that uh, is inspired by the movie Avatar, and it has lots of like really bright blue leaves and really iridescent leaves, leaves that glow in low light conditions. So that's Avatararium. <laughs> I, ha I have one that's like inspired by Jurassic Park, my favorite film. Yes, I'm 40. And uh, there is a tiny little raptor in it, so that's the Raptarium. <laughs> Uh, and then I have one that's at the King Kongarium because it's, it, it's inspired by Skull Island from King Kong. So it has like, these big cliffs. I won't tell you too much about it, but so the, the terrariums are named, the plants are not. Yeah. Okay. Have you only Jesus or other members of the family? Um, there's only one other plant in our flat that has a name, and that's an enormous Strelitzia vagina, which my boyfriend named the pterodactyl because of the uh, flowers. <laughs> Amazing. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you for the lovely question, Rosie. And that's all we've time for this week. Thank you so much to everyone who asked a question. And thanks for joining us wherever you are. Now, most of you will be well aware that the RHS Chelsea Flower Show gets underway next week. And for the first time in our 75-year history, GQT will have its very own garden at the show. <laughs> We'll have the first in a series of special broadcasts from Chelsea next week, so don't miss that. Until then, from me, Cathy Clugston, our wonderful panel, James Wong, Pippa Greenwood and Anne Swithenbank, our audience here at the Welcome Collection in London and all the GQT team, it's goodbye. <laughs> Garden is Question Time is produced by Dominic Tymon. The assistant producer is Bethany Hocken. It's a Something Else production for BBC Radio 4. In a moment, Matthew Sweet on Einstein, Relativity, Time and Indigenous Australian Modernism. First, news of Woman's Hour on Tuesday. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe talks exclusively to me, Emma Barnett, for a special Woman's Hour programme. What started as a holiday visiting family ended with almost six years of separation from her husband Richard and daughter Gabriella. And now for the first time, she tells her full story of her imprisonment in Iran, how she survived solitary confinement, how the love of her daughter kept her alive, and what Prime Minister Boris Johnson told her about the real reason for her imprisonment. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe on Woman's Hour, this Tuesday morning at 10 on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. In a quarter of an hour, we'll be in Barcelona in the 30s. Our drama is a woman's story of love, loss and resistance in the Spanish Civil War. In Diamond Square, stars Maxine Peake. It's at three o'clock. Now, here's Matthew Sweets with the latest in the series, which investigates events and objects from 1922 that still have an impact a century later. 1922, The Birth of Now. Episode 10, The End of Time. Do you remember David the beginning the of this series? 15 minutes, but first, our exploration of modernism continues. Well, this is not the beginning. I think this is the bit where we meet ourselves coming back. In 1922, the universe ended. Hello. In 1922, the universe began. Talking about modernism can make people so portentous, can't it? Or do I mean pretentious? You can only be portentous about an event in the future. And if 1922 was the future, well, all that's behind us now. The universe it brought into being was a place of radical uncertainty, a place of revolution and rebellion where everything was called into question. Yes, I said that, but could a top theoretical physicist be persuaded to say something similar? Certainties and fixed ways of thinking about the world are indeed breaking down there. They're breaking down in the face of experimental evidence. The power of the new uncertainty, <laughs> yeah. if we can put it that way, 
that came with relativity and with quantum theory, that uncertainty grew from the certainty of, of experimental data. That means that we have to let go of things that we were very certain of and embrace a new, a new uncertainty. That was the top theoretical physicist, Faye Dauka. Of that, we can be very sure. And she mentioned relativity. Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity. The idea that broke that old Newtonian universe apart. So, what was this new universe? What shape was it? What did it give us? Not a question, sorry. It gave us a new world view in which the existing world is not three-dimensional with three-dimensional things in it and time passing but the world the really existing physical world is four-dimensional it's the, the world view that it gives us is one of history so I am my history and you are your history that's the most meaningful way to talk about anything that exists physical things that exist. Now, right at the beginning of this series, we said that 1922 was an important year for Einstein, and therefore an important year for space and time. In 1922, Einstein was awarded the Nobel Prize, but not the Nobel Prize for 1922. That went to Niels Bohr for his work on the structure of the atom, which he published in 1913. So Einstein's 1922 prize was for 1921, and not for general relativity, which he'd published in 1916. He got it for his work on photons from 1905. The importance of these dates, I think, depends on the position of the observer. So from what position should we observe Einstein? Well, let's find out where he was in 1922, and then work it out. And the answer is, Japan. In 1922, Einstein was very big in Japan. He went there in October and was a bit overwhelmed. The common language of science. The first step to work language. He lectured for four hours at a time. Crowds mobbed him. His personal space was invaded and his personal space time. Photographed for the 10,000th time, dinner that almost lasts forever. Even the fact that Einstein was the greatest scientist of all time, it's not really surprising mm. that he was treated as such. The historian Satona Suzuki. And also there was this culture of omotenashi in Japanese. Um, I, can, I don't know whether you heard of it. No, tell me about that. It's an incredibly attentive Japanese hospitality. The idea is to show respect and mm. appreciation towards guests without expecting anything in return. The hostess of the inn is deeply thrilled and on her knees bows her head to the ground around a hundred times. If you're not used to it, you might feel that it's over the top like Einstein did. We're used to thinking of Einstein as a super being who stands in a kind of eternal space. He's always being wise in memes, isn't he? And sometimes the quotes attributed to him are even accurate. But the private journal he kept of his Asian trip situates him very much in his moment, in his culture. He didn't like Japanese table etiquette. Sitting on the floor is difficult. He felt sorry for the crustaceans he was served for his dinner. Poor creatures. Oh. And his views on the Japanese were, um, well... Among us, we see many Japanese living a lonely existence, studying diligently, smiling in a friendly manner. No one can fathom the feelings concealed behind this guarded smile. Hmm. Thanks, Albert. Einstein's a Johnny-come-late in this case, clearly. That's Margot Neal. She runs the new Centre for Indigenous Knowledges at the National Museum of Australia. Because he's probably plugging into some universal truth that Aboriginal people, probably first peoples around the world, must have plugged into. Now, I like this, Margot Neal bringing Einstein's modern ideas about time into contact with indigenous Australian ideas about time from, well, 60,000 years ago. Not that the numbers matter. You see your future 
in the footprints behind you. That really does embody our concept of time. So it clearly shows a continuous cyclical kind of nature. Our traditional knowledge is based on no breakages of time. It means that where you've been informs where you're going and therefore it informs the present and the present is already informed by the past. So the present, which is now the future, in the so-called past, is now, of course, the present, which informs the, the, the next cycle of time. So time just sort of cycles on and it keeps enriching itself with what came before. Hang on, hang on, this sounds very familiar. To my ears, it sounds like T.S. Eliot. Time present and time past are both perhaps present in time future and time future contained in time past. Exactly. Well, see, all these fellas, these white fellas, they came to this very late, you know. So what would an indigenous Australian reader detect in Eliot, in the wasteland, in the four quartets? In traditional times, no one read words anyway, but anyone who was then colonised to the point of being able to read, it would resonate big time. What might have been and what has been point to one end which is always present. You see your future in the footprints behind you. Footfalls echo in the memory. People had incorporated into the dreaming, you know the story of the dreaming, the um, envelope of knowledge without discernment becomes whatever you know is needs to be talked about and passed on get incorporated into these ceremonial song cycles. We don't often hear Indigenous Australian commentators talking about modernism, but the other way round, well, that's a much better established idea. When Indigenous Australian artists were exhibited for the first time in the Northern Hemisphere, critics thought they saw Aboriginal modernism. There was a lot of this talk in 1987 at an exhibition in New York called Dreamings. Critics looked at the work of artists such as Mick Kubaku and Emily Kaninguare and thought they saw modernist abstraction. Margot knows Emily Kaninguare's work well and wrote a book about her. It's called The Impossible Modernist. You know, I'm talking about Emily Kaninguare, who's a, you know, what you would call, Westerners would call a modernist artist now at the sea. But when she saw the work of artists like um, Solowit and other artists, she would say, why do those fellas paint like me? Whereas the Westerners who were selling the works of Solowit and other people, they would think Emily has been influenced by them, which clearly she wasn't because she lives in a remote community out in the middle of the desert and knows nothing about Western art history. So it's probably that in reverse. So if somebody was uh, of a traditional mindset and someone read T.S. Eliot to them, they would say, how come that fella's copying us? In relativity, what does the idea of now mean? <laughs> That's a fantastic question. That's the, that is the central question. In the theory as we have it, the only concept of now that exists is local. You can't talk about now for the whole universe. That concept is gone. It's just not there. You can, I think, talk about local nows. So there's now for me, now, 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 now. And you, presumably, in the studio, there's now, 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 now for you. And those things are not coordinated with each other. You can't coordinate your nows with my nows. That doesn't, that's not possible. But there still are individual local nows for you and for me and for everyone else and for everything else. Now, the modernists of 1922, lots of those whose voices you've heard in this series, claim the now. We have an infinite yard. Burning, burning, burning. Gone, Philomel. <laughs> Which gave everyone who came after them a problem. Because if now was then, what is now now? In the second half of the 20th century, some answered this question by dismissing it. 
The novelist Kingsley Amis, for instance, used to talk about modernism as a blip. But it's not a blip, because blips are quick and modernism hasn't really gone away. Postmodernism preserved it, treated it as another style to reproduce and ironize and enjoy. And in doing so, it elevated it even further, made modernism seem like the last kind of art that took itself completely seriously. And that had a downside too, because it stopped us seeing how funny the modernists could be. Modernism offered itself as an escape from history into a new, clean, post-historical zone. It still makes this offer in smooth, rational spaces, in the pristine lobbies of expensive hotels and those how much apartments by the river. Architectural modernism, you may have noticed, is now for the rich, though once it was available at very reasonable rates from local councils. But you can't escape history, even if you're Le Corbusier. That was a dream that modernism had about itself. Modernism was deeply implicated in its moment, but we've forgotten much about that moment. The big landmarks, Ulysses and the Wasteland, remain visible, but we've lost our sense of the land. So that's why in this series I've tried to show what's there. The occult, Mussolini, money from the Daily Mail, cocaine, the rising notes of Louis Armstrong's cornet. Because once you know the context, once you know the history, modernism looks different. It's not diminished, but it's in its place, in its time, in 1922. And in 2022, 1922 can still be present to us, vividly, powerfully. Stephen Daedalus, who is Joyce's representative in Ulysses, says, history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. Modernism, I suppose, is a proposal about what happens once we've woken up. But a hundred years later, many of its texts seem to me to be very dreamlike, full of magic and visions, and we can join those dreams. So 1922, The Birth of Now, was written and presented by Matthew Sweet. The reader was Michael Begley and the programme was produced by Julian May. Our drama in a couple of minutes is a story of love in a time of war, starring Maxine Peake. Before that, a fascinating new series starring Tiny Things begins tomorrow lunchtime. Everybody needs insects in their life, whether you realise it or not. Five pioneering insects. One beetle in particular has taught us how to extract water out of thin air. Metamorphosis, how insects transformed our world with Dr. Erica McAllister. Insects are some of the most important organisms on the planet. They can adapt from one environment to another. We can learn so much about how we too can live in a changeable environment. Metamorphosis, how insects transformed our world. This Monday to Friday afternoon at 1.45 on Radio 4 and BBC Sounds. BBC News at three o'clock. Government ministers have insisted there's been no attempt by Boris Johnson to influence a report into Downing Street parties as the deadline approaches for those who face criticism to give a response. Anyone named in the report by the senior civil servant Sue Gray has until five o'clock to respond. Our political correspondent Jonathan Blake says that while there are still a lot of unknowns about the document, its publication will mean a bumpy time ahead for the prime minister. There'll undoubtedly, I think, be some uncomfortable reading for the Prime Minister and others, given what Sue Gray said when her draft report was published earlier in the year, failures of leadership and judgment. Uh, but the, the scale, I think, and the, the level of detail that's um, laid bare by this report when it comes will be crucial for Boris Johnson. One of the UK's biggest energy companies, E.ON, has warned that the number of its customers in fuel poverty is set to double from 20% to 40% by the autumn, when prices will be reviewed again. The company's chief executive, Michael Lewis, has called on the government to take substantial action to help households struggling with bills. The Ukrainian government says it won't agree to any ceasefire or peace deal with Moscow that would involve giving up territory. A senior advisor to President Zelensky, Mikhail Padilyok, said such a concession would leave the country vulnerable to future Russian attacks. 
Police are investigating after a man and a teenage girl died in a fire at a house in Cumbria. Emergency services were called to the property in Distington shortly before 5 o'clock this morning. A 14-year-old girl and a 58-year-old man were confirmed dead at the scene. The annual World Health Assembly meeting in Geneva is discussing a rare outbreak of monkeypox. Experts can't explain why the virus has been detected in at least a dozen countries worldwide when it's more often found in Africa. The UK has seen at least 20 cases with the Health Security Agency saying numbers are increasing on a daily basis. BBC.